But before I start and tell you about this topic, I just want to say a couple of brief words that, one, we are not anti-psychiatry. We are not anti-psychiatric drugs. We're here to talk about the risks and benefits of psychiatric drugs and don't mean to diminish anybody's experience of being helped by these drugs. Some people certainly do benefit from psychiatric drugs, so it's not our intent to condemn those that prescribe them, nor to condemn the experience of those who benefit from them. But we're here to ask you for your help. Because what's happened over the course of the last several years is that problems that have occurred in our culture, especially Western culture, with increased secularism, materialism, greed, and social injustice has virtually been ignored in terms of its cause of rising problems of humanity. And instead, suffering has been seen to be cured by prescription instead of other means of interventions such as church, community, and psychotherapy. And in fact, children, the elderly, frail, pregnant women are intervened upon with psychiatric drugs as the first line of intervention. Which actually puts physicians in a somewhat precarious position, like my little friend up here on the picture. And that is that physicians typically do not look at the data themselves. They rely on others to translate that data for them. But with the increase in litigation because of suicide and birth defects, it would behoove physicians to begin to understand the data themselves from the clinical trials. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today. That's what your handout is about. And a visit to the website depicted on the handouts, you also can download these actual clinical trials and look at them yourselves and form your own conclusions. So here's the current state of prescriptions. It's been an amazing rise in prescriptions in the last 10 years. And in fact, there's been more money spent on mental disorder treatment by drugs with children than by any other problems of children. In fact, spending has surpassed the spending on antibiotics for children. Almost nine billion United States dollars are spent on psychiatric drugs for children. From 1996 to um, 2006, there was a 73% increase in prescriptions for adults and 15% for children. 15 million children in the United States are taking psychiatric drugs. And if you look at the slide that's currently up there, over $40 billion are spent on psychiatric drugs in the United States, depicted by the different categories you see there. There's a global increase. It's just not an American problem at this point. There's a 274% global increase in the use of psychiatric drugs. And the problem that goes along with that is that there's been a decrease in funding for psychosocial interventions that aren't drug-oriented. Now, the question is, are these rising prescription rates justified by the clinical trial data? That's the basic question of evidence-based medicine. Does the current practice, is it justified by what we know from research? And actually, the research paints quite a different picture. If we just look at antidepressants, for example, the only population-based study ever done with antidepressants compared users and non-users in the real world with antidepressants found a frequent, more frequent of episodes in users and also longer duration of depression in users as compared to non-users. If we look at all of the clinical trial data that's ever been submitted to the FDA in the United States, all of the clinical trial data in a meta-analysis by Irving Kirsch, we find that there's no difference between placebo and antidepressants except for the very severely depressed. So your average person with a diagnosis of depression is helped no more by the drug than they are by placebo. And of course, 
that makes us be more, even more concerned about the side effects that go along given these minimal positive benefits. And the side effects actually are quite plentiful with antidepressants, including birth defects and suicide, especially among young adults. And what about antipsychotics? Actually, the evidence paints quite a different picture. You know, that's the number one grossing medication in the United States now are antipsychotics because they're not only being prescribed for psychosis, they're being prescribed for behavioral management of children and behavioral management of the frail elderly. But the largest study ever done about antipsychotics in the uni United States is the Katy trial. 1,400 participants, 57 United States cities looking at first generation and second generation antipsychotics. 74% of the patients in this trial did not complete the treatment. They dropped out before 18 months of service, 18 months of treatment. Combined with that, of the third that completed one year, only a third of those who completed had a modest effect in terms of their quality of their living. And the side effect package was just incredible. First of all, consider the 74% dropout rate, but also consider that um, over 60% experience moderate to severe side effects along with that. And that just supports what patients have been telling us for some time about antipsychotics, is that they're not well tolerated, there's a significant side effect burden that comes along with them, and they don't tend to help a whole lot other than their sedation effects on behavior. Looking at psychotropic medication for children, the American Psychological Association um, assigned a task force to look at the data. They reviewed all of the clinical trial data with children and psychotropics in a 274-page report that's available on the APA website, and they concluded this statement that I want to just read the last part to you now and that is that it is our recommendation that in most cases psychosocial interventions be tried first. Medication should not be the first order of treatment. Because the risks for children are quite substantial, and here are the risks that you don't read too much about, and that is for manic behavior or what's called often achesthesia, this inner restlessness that is so tumultuous that a person has to act and do something to change it. And oftentimes, those are acts of suicide or acts of violence against others. There's two times the rate of suicidal behavior in those that take antidepressants. Those are just kind of the highlights. There are many other. There's a growth suppression effect to antidepressants. Let's move on to stimulant medication, and you have a similar kind of a process. There's a cardiac arrest problem. There's growth suppression effects. 64% in the largest clinical trial ever done with Ritalin stimulants, um, the MTA, found that 64% of the children in that trial had moderate to severe side effects, including psychosis and cardiac symptoms. Growth suppression is a, is a fact in that you don't ever regain the loss of growth that you have that's determined by the stimulants. And then finally, antipsychotics have a very, very negative risk profile for children, including tardive dyskinesia, um, as well as weight gain in as much as two-thirds of children that are taking antipsychotics. Here's one child's story of antidepressants. I just had like an impulse, like just to like go like grab the medicine and just take it and that's what I did. On March 31st, I took a lot of my pills and I tried to kill myself. I was kind of scared because I was like, well, it wasn't me, but it was me. Like I did do this. When I went to the psychiatrist, she was saying that since I was starting to feel lower that I needed more. So she would like keep giving me more and it kept getting worse. And then I think by December or January, I was on like 300 milligrams of Effexor. It's more than you're supposed to be taking like as an adult. I was taking it and then I was just feeling like horrible. I felt like a walking zombie. And like if this helps like one person, then you know, I've accomplished my goal and you know, I've done what I wanted to do. 